Hey guys, my name is Pixie from Appy Builder, and in this video you'll learn how to create a collection of data, also known as a list. This tutorial is aimed at viewers who have little to no programming experience, but you are familiar with using Appy Builder. Since these are concepts, most of the videos in this series are designed to be used as a reference guide, along with the section on my website and the Appy Builder documentation, which has a lot more detailed information about component properties and individual blocks. Even if you don't know what these blocks do, I'm going to assume that you know where the block comes from, either because of its color or the words on the blocks. If you want to follow along, I would recommend watching a minute or two, then pausing the video and copying what you've learned on the screen. That will allow you to listen to the explanation so you're not just blindly copying what you see on the screen and missing out on important information. That being said, let's get started. In programming languages, arrays, dictionaries, and lists are used to store a collection of data in one single variable. In Appy Builder, we specifically use the list block. Now, I don't expect you to follow along with me for this video. This is just an explanation of all of the built-in list blocks and what they do. To help you visually follow along a little better, I've added two different labels to the design, and they're both contained in horizontal arrangements. Hopefully this will make it easier to see the output a little bit better. In the blocks editor, let's go ahead and create a global variable named food list. As you probably guessed from the name, the purpose of this variable is to store a list of food items. We can use the first two blocks in the list panel to populate this array. The create empty list block does exactly what it says, but it can be used two different ways. If we declare a variable as an empty list, we're basically saying, I plan on using this variable as a list, but I will add items to it later on. You'll learn a little more about dynamically populating a list in the loops tutorial. This block can also be used to clear every item in a list, which is really useful when you're creating games. We won't need this block just yet. Instead, let's populate this list using the make a list block. Click on the mutator to add a total of five items to this list. We can represent each food item using a string data type. I'm going to type cherry, lemon, lime, strawberry, and watermelon as my food items, but you can use whatever food items that you want. So far, we've been creating variables with only one value, like this, where x equals 5. If we displayed the value of x on label 1 using the getter block, we should see the number 5. A list is a collection of multiple values. So if we displayed the value of food list on label 1, we would see every single item in this list. In order to access each individual item in the list, we have to call its index value. Each item in the collection has a numeric index. In most programming languages, an index will always start at 0. For example, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's important to know that if you plan on learning a programming language, but remember, Appy Builder tries to simplify the programming process for you. Counting an index in Appy Builder is just like normal counting. One, two, three, four, five. So if I asked you, what is the value stored in food list index three, you would say the value is lime. Index one would be cherry, index two is lemon, and index three is lime. Now take a look at the index in list and select list item blocks. We use the first block when we know the value, but we don't know the index. And we use the second block when we know the index, but we don't know the value. Now, throughout this video, I'm just going to set up the blocks. Remember, you don't have to follow along with me. This is just an explanation of what these blocks do. So feel free to pause the video every few minutes and study what you see on the screen and compare that to what you see in the live tester. For the first block, let's search for watermelon. For the second block, let's search for the value stored in index 2. In the live tester, the first line of my label says five. This means that we found watermelon in the list and that value is stored in index five. If your output is zero, that means the value doesn't exist anywhere in the list. For example, if I had searched for watermelon in all capital letters, my output should be zero. If you recall from the previous tutorial, we know what a watermelon is, but the computer doesn't. These are two totally different strings to a computer. 
we see a zero because watermelon in all capital letters does not exist anywhere in this list. Since we're using all lowercase letters in our list, we should use the downcase block to convert our search string into lowercase letters. The second line shows the value lemon because that is the value stored in index 2. Recall from earlier in the video, if I wanted to see the value of x, I would use the getter block on this label, and I should see the value 5. If I use the getter block on my food list variable, I would see every single item in the food list, right? But if I want to display only lemon on this label, I would use the select list item block. We know that lemon is stored in index 2 on the food list because we hard-coded this list. Let's take a look at some of the blocks that help you check the data in your list. On the first line, we check to see if strawberry exists in the list. The output shows true, which means yes, this item exists in the food list. The second line shows the length of the list, which is 5, because there are 5 items in the list. The third line is pretty obvious. The output is false because is this list empty? No, there are five items in the list. An empty list would have zero items. And the fourth line displays a random item from the list. If I refresh the live tester, the first three lines will stay the same, but the fourth line should change. If the fourth line stays the same, that's just pure coincidence because there are only five items in the list. Now right now, our list is pretty static. We know that strawberry exists in the list. We don't actually have to check for it because we hard-coded in that value. We know the size of the list is five because we created this list with five items. So we probably wouldn't need to use these blocks on a list this small. But you could see how these blocks might come in handy if you need to search a list that has a few thousand items. Now let's take a look at some of the blocks we can use to make changes to this list. I'm gonna pull four of them off to the side and we'll test them out one at a time. If we want to add an item to the list, we use the add items to list block. To use this block, you need to specify the list you want to add items to, and then use the mutator to add additional items to the list. I'm gonna add two items to this list, orange and blueberries. The items that you add to a list are automatically appended to the end of the current list. Orange would be index 6 and blueberries would be index 7. You can see what this looks like in the live tester. Code is always executed in order from top to bottom, so label 1 shows the original 5 items from the food list, then we add 2 more items to the food list, and display the updated list in label 2. Notice that orange and blueberries were automatically added to the end of the list. The add items to list block will automatically add each item to the end of the list in numerical order. So if we added another item to this list, its index should be 8, then 9, then 10, and so on. If we want to add an item to this list at a specific index, we would use the insert block. For example, insert orange into the food list at index 3, and then compare label 1 and label 2 in the live tester. You can't actually see the indexes here on these labels, but you can count them. In label one, the item stored in index three is lime, but in label two, index three has been replaced with orange and index four is now lime. There are now six items in the food list and all of the indexes after index three have increased by one from their original index. Now the next block will allow you to overwrite or edit values in the list at a specific index. So let's say we wanted to change the value of watermelon. Watermelon is stored in index five, so we could use this block to replace index five with the value orange. Take a look at the updated list in label two. Notice that watermelon no longer exists. There are five items in the list and watermelon has been replaced with orange. And as you probably guessed, we can use the remove list item block to delete an item from the list. Simply use the name of the list you want and the index you want to remove. In the live tester, you should see that label two only has four items. The first item has been completely removed from the list and the remaining four items have new indexes. Index one is now lemon, index two is now lime, index three is strawberry, and index four is watermelon. 
If you feel like you're a little lost, go ahead and pause the video right here. Take a moment to just play around with the blocks that you've seen in the video so far. Remember, you don't have to follow along with me. What's important is that you understand what you're seeing on the screen. When you're ready, you can unpause the video and continue. We've got a few more blocks towards the end of the panel to play around with. The term append means add on, usually to the end of something. And we can use this block to add items to the end of a list from a second list. For example, copy and paste the food list variable, change the name to extra food list, and then change all of the items in the second list to whatever you want. I'll use orange, blueberry, raspberry, grape, and pear. Label one is still going to display the original food list. And we can use this block to append the items from extra food list to the end of food list. So label two shows the updated food list. We can also make a copy of this list, which is really useful if we want to keep the original data intact and allow the user to make changes to the copy of the list. This time I'll declare a variable as food list copy, set to an empty list. When this app starts, food list has five items and food list copy is empty. It has zero items. Use label one to display the original list and then set food list copy to make a copy of food list. Then use label two to display the food list copy. The items displayed in both labels should be identical. Notice this block towards the bottom of the panel named is a list. This block will check the data type of whatever you snap into it and return either true or false. For example, if I snap in food list, now read the block. Is food list a list? It's not going by the name of the variable, it's going by the data type of the variable. I could snap this into one of the labels and then run the live tester, but let's just right click the block and choose do it. As you can imagine, the result is true, which means yes, food list is a list. Of course, we know that because we hard coded the list. This block would come in handy if you're not sure if your variable has been properly formatted as a list. Now let's take a look at this group of CSV blocks. CSV stands for comma separated values. There are four blocks here, but there are two categories, row and table. We can use these blocks to convert a list to and from a CSV row or table. The list from CSV row block is an alternative to the make a list block. Take a look at these two variables and compare them. They are exactly the same list, but they're just written a little bit differently. In the second list, you can see that each item is separated by a comma. The upside to using the make a list block is that we can see every item on the screen. The downside, of course, is that it takes up a lot of space on the screen and it's more tedious because you have to individually add each new item. Using the list from CSV row block, you can take up a lot less space, but the downside is that you can't see all of your items. You have to click on the text block and then use the arrow keys to see the rest of your data. Either one of these options would work to create a list. The one that you choose is based on your preferences. The list to CSV row block will allow you to convert your Appy Builder list to standard CSV format. I'm going to add apple juice to the food list and delete the second food list. We don't need it anymore. Label one is going to display the food list and label two is going to convert the food list to standard CSV format. Let's compare both labels in the live tester. Appy Builder creates a basic format to display the items in a list. Notice that the items in the list are enclosed within parentheses and separated by spaces. The parentheses help indicate to us as the developer that this data type is a list. There is one downside to this format and that is the spaces. Take a closer look at the sixth index in the food list and the output on label one. Apple juice is two words. So if we use this format, apple juice would look like two different items. Now take a look at label two, which is showing the food list in standard CSV format. Each item is enclosed within double quotation marks and separated by a comma. Label two shows six items. Whereas if we didn't know any better, we would think that label one had seven items. These formats are for your use as the developer. This is not the output that you would want to show to your users because it's messy and unorganized. 
You'll learn how to create your own format later in this tutorial series, but you should absolutely use these blocks to help debug problems with your data. As you can imagine, the to and from CSV table blocks are very similar to the CSV row blocks. A row is a single dimensional list. Both of these lists are one dimension, meaning we have one index, one item, one index, one item, one index, one item. A table has multiple dimensions made up of rows and columns. Everything that you've learned in this tutorial pertain to a single dimensional list. We're going to take a closer look at multiple dimensions in the next tutorial, and we're going to discuss the last three blocks at the end of the next tutorial. If you feel like you've understood the basics of a single dimensional list, then good job, you are ready to move on to the next video in this series. That about sums up this tutorial. Don't forget to leave a thumbs up on this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. You can view all of my videos directly on YouTube, but if you need a little extra help with this tutorial series, you'll find it here on my website. Click on the tutorials link in the top navigation. Right now, each section just contains the videos that you should watch in order and some notes from the video. If you click on the to do link in the nav bar, you'll also see a list of things that I plan on adding to the website over time. So keep checking my website for updates. Also, remember that Appy Builder has a really detailed documentation containing information about the properties and blocks for every component. This section will eventually have a video on every major component, and it's a great tool if you really want to master Appy Builder. If you need help for school or projects you're currently working on, make sure you check out the Appy Builder community. You'll find more tips and tutorials there written by community members. That's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and have a great day. Bye.